Dream homes in dream locations. From the Norfolk coast of Kingdom to the Yorkshire countryside of Emmerdale. Our favourite TV dramas and films feature some of Britain's most stunning places to live. In this series, we're going on a journey to visit parts of the country that have been made famous on our screens. We'll find out if the reality lives up to the fantasy. It is one of those places where it does have a special feel about it. And take a look at some of the best properties we found on the market in these fantastic locations. As we meet the people lucky enough to live the dream as seen on screen. Welcome to Live the Dream as Seen on Screen, the property show that takes you to the heart of your favourite dramas. Now in each show we're going to be giving you the inside track on some of the best places to live in Britain. And today's show features some truly breathtaking scenery as we visit homes with views to die for. From stunning sunsets to coastal panoramas, rugged mountain ranges to rolling fells, Britain is blessed with some truly awe-inspiring views. Just look at it, it's incredible! These landscapes are a filmmaker's dream. If they handed out BAFTAs for best scenery, there'd certainly be plenty of contenders. It's sublime. But what's it like to live in these great locations? To find out, today's show sees us visit three homes, each with views to die for. That is amazing. I'll be heading to the Northumberland coast, setting for many a swashbuckling drama, to meet the family whose home contains more than a few secrets. It's just like having an ensuite castle, it's quite, it's quite cool actually. Meanwhile, I'll be taking in the stunning scenery of North Wales, as I go in search of property close to Britain's strangest TV location. Quite a beautiful place really, isn't it? And meet the family who live in one of the area's most amazing homes. Where I think we are is the sort of place that some people spend hours getting to just to see a view and we just open the door and mm. there it is. But we start today's show with a fascinating house that's not only a film star in its own right, it was also once owned by a very famous children's author. So I put on my hiking boots and travelled to the Lake District to find out more. The Lake District is one of the most spectacular and celebrated parts of Britain. Its rippling lakes and majestic mountains have drawn a stream of visitors here for almost two centuries. I get so excited about visiting the Lake District. It doesn't even matter about the weather. Just because of the sheer scale and beauty of this place, it never fails to impress. But even for those who've never actually been here, it feels familiar thanks to the many films and TV shows set in its magnificent scenery. The colours all change in the autumn. The rain comes, fills up the lakes again. When we were kids, we came up here every Sunday, so my brother hates it now. I think it's the best place in the world. A young John Sim starred in the Jimmy McGovern drama, The Lakes, as a Liverpool lad making a fresh start in the landscape, so beloved of poets like William Wordsworth. It's also been the backdrop for movies such as Brief Encounter, With an Ale and I, and Miss Potter. The film brought to life the magical world of the children's writer Beatrix Potter, who lived in the area a century ago. It starred René Zellweger. There's something delicious about writing the first words of a story. You can never quite tell where they'll take you. They've taken me to the stunning location of the Miss Potter movie. Today I'm about to visit somewhere very special indeed. Can you see just down there in a valley on its own? It's a beautiful place, very close to Coniston Water. Of all the gorgeous properties there are in the Lake District, the movie makers chose this one, not least because it's a house that Beatrix Potter actually owned. Yew Tree Farm is a Grade 2 listed building set amongst 600 acres of stunning lake scenery. It's currently home to 300 sheep, a herd of unusually fluffy cows, a number of pigs, dogs and ducks, and of course, Caroline and John and their children, Iona and Archie. It's a 
fantastic lifestyle. Our children get to grow up in this wonderful environment. I get to follow the things that I've always been passionate about, which is farming and food. To be out on the fells, it's absolutely fantastic. The views, oh, it's, it's unbelievable. That's what I love. The Watsons moved here seven years ago, and as well as playing host to Hollywood, their home is a and b and I'm lucky enough to be staying here as a guest. It's a hard life, isn't it? Just look at that home. Oh my gosh, it's picture postcard perfect. Hello. hello. You must be Melissa. I'm Melissa Caroline. Caroline. Yeah, please, please to meet you. you. John, hello. John, hello. And this is little one. This is Archie, who's oh, asleep. Bless there. him. <laughs> The setting for the Watsons home is so spectacular, it proved a dream location for the movie makers. But the first thing I wanted to know was what it's actually like having Hollywood turn your house into a film set. Not a bad outlook, Miss Potter. It's sublime. The actual filming only lasted two days, but the setting it all up and getting the place looking right lasted about four, four weeks, weeks, wasn't it? Yeah, and then of course Kate, no. What did they do then? They had this vision of a, a dry stone wall and we really liked the idea and we wanted a wall but they were going to build it out of paper mache but uh, I'm afraid I put my foot down a bit and said no, I want a real wall and this is the result. I noticed that the garden as it is now is very different to how it looks. What do they do? Oh, it's absolutely different. Where we're stood now, there was 45 tonnes of topsoil plunk, plunked here and they had to make a vegetable garden out of it and they did that by, well, to be honest, they cheated. They got vegetables from supermarkets and from <laughs> yeah. wholesalers and the carrots were just the tops of carrots and they were plonked in. But it looked very good, it was really effective. Now, I want some dirt on Renee Zellweger. I'm five <laughs> foot ten and I understand, is it true she's about this high? <laughs> it did seem to be that height, yeah. <laughs> and this, sli she, this she's slip? tiny, yeah. Where would she sit? Would she sit in the main house? She did actually come yeah. through and have a little nosy, didn't she, yeah. through the day, which I was horrified about because everything was a mess. <laughs> but um, no, she had uh, they had Winnebago set up around the corner. How do you both feel then about living in such a special home? We've had Hollywood here. <laughs> yeah, it's something. Beatrix Potter. It is fascinating. There seems to be a lot happens here. It is one of those places where it does have a special feel about it. So stay with us because after the break, I'll be taking a look inside the magical yew tree farm. Oh my gosh, this is so cute. And still to come, our resident property historian, Nick Barrett, takes a trip to the mountains of Snowdonia. Ever heard of a house with its own private railway station? How did that come about? Well, it just came with the house. Plus, we've our pick of the property market in each of these fabulous locations, every one with a view to die for. Welcome back to Live the Dream as seen on screen, which today is all about homes with views to die for. Later in the show, we'll see some fantastic properties in Northumberland and Snowdonia. But first, it's back to the beautiful Lake District. Before the break, I met Caroline and John Watson, owners of Yew Tree Farm in Coniston. The house once belonged to Beatrix Potter and was recently used in the Hollywood movie of her life. The 300-year-old property naturally divides into two parts. The b and is at the front of the house. Here guests can choose from three traditionally styled rooms and sit down to breakfast at a table where Beatrix Potter may have actually written one of her children's classics. While the family live in a set of rooms at the back with spectacular views of the fells, and at the heart of it all is a traditional lakes kitchen. Oh my gosh, this is so cute. It's like stepping back in time. Oh no, that's the best bit, cakes. Delicious and baked by Caroline herself. Goodness me, this really is an exceptional place. You can almost feel the history seeping out through these 250 year old wood panels. I wanted Caroline to tell me more about this historic house that dates back to the time of William III. 
got a massive amount of original features in here. It's is, wonderful, isn't is it? Is that the original part of the building? Yes, it is. This is the this is the old part of the house, which is 1690 um, it, when it was built. And this is the original crack frame, which was the old style of building these houses. And it's one piece of wood all the way from the top to the bottom of the house. And as you can see, massive pieces of wood. Even the original farmhouse doors still hang in the house. Today the property is owned by the National Trust. The Watsons rent it off them and work with them to preserve its history. Karen, how have you managed to keep this place authentic then? Well, we had to work quite hard to make it look authentic, which sounds a bit ironic, but a lot of the fixtures and fittings of the house were sort of, there was white radiators and white switches and bad lighting in the house when we came to it. We replaced all the radiators with these lovely cast iron radiators and we have taken the lighting out and, and made it softer. All your bedrooms benefit from these stunning views. Yeah, it is absolutely fabulous, isn't it? We're very lucky um, that most of the windows do look out onto our wonderful Lake District landscape. Oh, Caroline, this is this is not what I imagined. It is beautiful. Yeah, it's not, lovely, isn't it? Not very 17th century, is it? No, that's right. Well, obviously, there's nothing really that would be appropriate in terms of bathrooms anyway, so we decided to, to go with it a little bit. And we've used local slate, which is from the mountain you can see out the window, and uh, it's underfloor heated, old-fashioned sort of, fa you know, fixtures and fitting, but in the chrome. It's lovely, isn't it? Very, very glamorous. How many people can you get in that bath? I have, I've had the whole family in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Watsons part of the property at the other end of the farmhouse is more modern, with the decor in keeping with the needs of a young family. While guests can relax in a living room styled in the muted colours and dark wood furniture favoured by Beatrix Potter herself. This is the room that most illustrates how Beatrix Potter was connected with the farm. Oh yeah. Um, in the 1930s she, she bought the farm to basically protect it as it was for sale and it was going to be bought by developers. And at the time farming was going through quite a bad period and the tenants couldn't pay their rent and she offered the chance to tenants of, of providing them with furniture so they could open a tea room. So all this is authentic Beatrix Potter furniture? That's right, yeah. The tables, the ornaments, candlesticks, everything in here. She brought in and the tenants then were able to set up a tea room and it was, it was the beginning of diversification in this area really. She did bring in curios as well, so over here you can see letters signed by Wordsworth, John Ruskin, which is incredible really. And she was very aware of her own fame and that's why it was interesting for visitors to come and see what belonged to her. There's a terrific sense of history being brought back to life here. But I wanted to know in what way living here today was a dream come true for John and Caroline and their young family. You live in a beautiful home in a beautiful part of the world. Have you always wanted to live somewhere like this? I've always loved the countryside and obviously the Lake District's always been special to me and it is just so stunning, you couldn't not love it really, could you? So when you initially arrived down the driveway, viewed the property, did you both think, yep, this is going to be my family home? We were standing, it looked absolutely stunning and it was a lovely day and there was this backdrop of the fells. We were amazed by it. I didn't like to think that we would ever stand the chance of living in a place like this, but uh... Yeah, reality is a marvellous thing. It's easy for someone like me to come from a city to this beautiful environment and look at it through rose-tinted glasses and think, you are living the dream. Are you really? I think in some ways we definitely are. It's a fantastic lifestyle. We get to, you know, our children get to grow up in this wonderful environment. Yeah! I get to follow the things that I've always been passionate about, which is farming and food and cooking and all that sort of farmhousey lifestyle. That's it, roll your sleeves up. But the reality can be quite hard at times. It's long hours, hard work, virtually no money. <laughs> and you know, it, it, sometimes it's a struggle, but generally speaking, we are very lucky. My life, obviously, um, is centered around Caroline and the kids, and it's great to have them here with me in my workplace. Is that Charlie or Lola? That's Charlie. Hello? <laughs> my work takes me away from the house, and to be out on the fells on a clear, frosty morning, it's absolutely fantastic. The views, oh, it's, it's unbelievable. That's what I love. The amazing history of this beautiful old house and its brush with Hollywood glamour made this a very special place to live. It feels very magical here. 
From the dark wood interiors to the luxurious bathrooms and the furniture owned by Beatrix Potter herself, being at Yew Tree Farm is a wonderful experience. And its spectacular location makes this a perfect place in which to live the dream. If you want to follow in the footsteps of the Watsons and find your dream home in the Lake District, here's a taste of some of the best property recently on the market here. Set just a little way back from the shores of Coniston Water, this 17th century cottage has a similar feel to Yew Tree Farm. The sitting room has lots of original features, including a stone floor and a beamed ceiling. And the two double bedrooms have great views over the fells. We found it on the market for £350,000. Just a couple of miles up the road is this traditional Lakeland farmhouse. Inside there's a characterful living room, farmhouse kitchen and four spacious bedrooms. The seven acres of grounds offer a fantastic vantage point of Coniston Water. And the cost of this stunning property? £995,000. But our pick of the crop has to be this converted barn near Hawkshead, complete with its stunning contemporary interior and open plan design. The spectacular first floor living room is flooded with natural light and makes the most of the original wooden beams that are part of the barn's construction. This four bedroom property offers Lakes luxury for £545,000. But whatever your budget, there are plenty of ways to live the dream in this most beautiful part of Britain. Wow, some really fantastic properties. Now, if you like the look of that lot, do stay tuned because there's still plenty more to come. I find out about the cult 60s TV show that made a lasting impression on this stretch of North Wales coastline. And discover why living in Snowdonia is so special. I have to pinch myself sometimes to check I'm, I'm not dreaming. I meet the family in Northumberland who bagged themselves the grand country home of their dreams. Oh, this is incredible. And if you fancy buying your own home with a view, we've got the very best of the property market. Welcome back. Now, the Snowdonia National Park recently won a National Trust Award for having some of the most stunning views in the whole of Britain. But there's actually more to the region than just spectacular scenery. It was also used as a setting in a very memorable TV series. I travelled to North Wales to find out more. The Snowdonia National Park is home to some of the most magnificent scenery in Wales. It's a landscape that has inspired poets and artists, and it's where Sir Edmund Hillary came to prepare before he climbed Mount Everest. This is an area that I used to visit as a child, so I've really been looking forward to coming back here and reliving some fantastic memories. The first stop of my journey is here, overlooking the Dwyrith Estuary. As you can see, the views are quite amazing, and this peninsula is also home to one of Snowdonia's most unusual attractions. This is Port Merion. It's a few miles down the road from the Welsh harbour town of Port Madoch. And as you can see, it's no ordinary village. Now, I'm a bit of a fanatic when it comes to interesting architecture, and I've visited some unusual places in my time. But this extraordinary village has to be the strangest of the lot. It was all the vision of one man, Sir Clough Williams Ellis. Clough bought the land that Port Merion stands on in 1925 for just £5,000, and spent the next 50 years of his life transforming it into an homage to Mediterranean culture. Today, Port Merion is a major tourist attraction, but not all its visitors come here just to see its unusual architecture. And that's where things get even stranger, because Port Merion is also a mecca for fans of a certain cult 60s TV series. Your attention, please. Here are two announcements. Ice cream is now on sale for your enjoyment. The flavour of the day is strawberry. The Prisoner was one of the most baffling and bizarre shows on our screens. It starred Patrick McGowan as number six, a former British agent held captive by a strange, unidentified power in a small seaside village. 
The series was almost entirely shot here, with Port Merion providing a suitably surreal backdrop to all the strange goings on. Mr. The prisoner put this stretch of coastline well and truly on the map. It was these incredible views that attracted Clough Williams Ellis to this area. And if you venture further up in the Welsh hills, they become even more spectacular. Port Merion isn't the only place that's been used as a film location in this area. The dramatic mountains of Snowdonia are a regular feature on our screens. They've doubled for the Himalayas in Carry On Up the Khyber and were used as a remote area of China in the Hollywood action flick Tomb Raider Cradle of Life. Up in these hills you could be a million miles from anywhere and you literally get the feeling you could spend days without seeing another soul. Which is exactly what appealed to Hugh and Sue Jenkins and led them to buy what is reputedly one of the oldest inhabited houses in Wales. We were living busy, hectic lives, far too much time commuting, not enough time for each other, and we found this place out in the middle of nowhere. It's absolutely wonderful here. It's so peaceful, there's very little noise, and the views are absolutely astounding. Hugh had spent years working with computer software systems, and Sue had been a busy social worker. Keen to escape their hectic lifestyles in Hampshire, the Jenkins family took the plunge and relocated here, some 500 feet up in the foothills of the Snowdonian Mountains. Their amazing four-bedroom property, which dates back to the 15th century, is quite literally on the side of a mountain. And the steep kilometre-long drive used to reach the house is not one to tackle in wintry conditions. Luckily, there's an alternative, much more romantic way of getting to the house because Hugh and Sue Jenkins are among the very few people in Britain to have their own private train platform. Hello, you must be Hugh. I am, pleased to meet you, Nick. Lovely to see you, Sue. How are you doing? Thanks so much for meeting me here. What an incredible journey. It is fantastic, all the way from Blynafestinog down to the coast at Port Maddock. And as of now, the track has been laid all the way through to Carnarvon Castle, so you can go by train, by steam train, stopping at the foot of Snowdon to Carnarvon Castle, 38 miles, fantastic. And not only that, I understand that you actually own this private platform. How did that come about? Well, it just came with the house. So the guy that brought the house back from dereliction was a big friend of the railway. And in return, the railway granted him the right to use the line to run his own engine on. And he had a little siding here where he'd park the train overnight. And each morning he'd set off in his train, drive a mile down the track, pick up his car, off to the office, and home again at the end of the day. And that's why it's called Campbell's Platform from Andrew Campbell, the guy who restored the house. It is just a beautiful place to live. And I'm dying to see your house. Can you show me Yes, yeah, by all means, come on. Hugh and Sue have so much more to thank Colonel Campbell for than just their private train platform. He's also responsible for much of the charm and the originality of the place that they call home. Good Lord. Dare I say it, this is quite an eccentric hallway. Quite unusual. And looks like a mix of different styles. When it comes to property, first impressions really do count. And if the entrance hall is anything to go by, I couldn't wait to see the rest of the house. I mean, goodness, look at those beams. <laughs> Absolutely huge. For me, it is just the perfect living room space, almost like the heart of the house. Yes, well, this is in fact the, the modern extension built in 1630 on four levels. We've got the cellar beneath us where prisoners used to be locked up during the Civil War. But this, this is the living room and there's nothing better than to fall asleep next to this log burner. I love the idea of a modern extension being built in 1630, not 1930 or 2000. I mean, there must be quite a lot of bits and pieces that have been added afterwards. Are those doors there? They look quite old. But... Yes, but, uh, you know, highly modified, that rounded bit at the top, you know, that's, that's been added 1960s by Colonel Campbell, no doubt. So basically, Colonel Campbell has shaped this room to his vision. Yeah, I think he's done it tastefully. He's changed things, but tastefully. One thing you couldn't change are these just amazing views. Oh my goodness. Do you like it? I love it. That is absolutely stunning. I don't know where to look first, really. There's well, so much to take in. This is where I like to look first. This is where the sun comes up in the morning. And I particularly like that, uh, that range over there. They're the Hrinog Mountains. And they stretch down to Harlech and to Barmouth. And they're really wild. You can walk all day up there and see no one. 
And then on the horizon there, we've got that strange looking building. That, uh, that is Britain's first and only inland nuclear power station, which stopped generating 18 years ago oh, right. and was in fact used as a, a backdrop to the filming of First Night back in the 1990s. So the whole area is steeped in TV history? Oh, it's a great location, yeah. And it's absolutely gorgeous to boot. It's actually quite appropriate that a film like First Night was shot in view of Hugh and Sue's house. Their home almost resembles a small castle. It's full of ancient stonework, and as a historian, that's something that really appeals to me. And I love a spiral staircase. It really gives a house that medieval feel to it, particularly one like this. Lots of rough hewn, heavy stone, really rugged feel to it. Yes, and uh, I don't know if you noticed, but it's going the wrong way. If you're a, a sword fighter, it's no darn good for defending your family against the attackers. So, you know, if you're right-handed, just no good at all. That would explain it. I thought it felt a bit peculiar. The medieval feel continues throughout the entire house. Upstairs, the Jenkins have complemented the feeling of grandeur with this rather impressive four-poster bed, complete with a 200-year-old Persian tapestry ceiling. But my favourite room of all has to be this atmospheric grand dining room with its bold limestone flooring and large open fire. Oh, and I just love the feel of this room. In particular, a lovely warm glow that's coming from behind me. Very this, welcoming. This is the modern fire. If you put your head underneath the beam, you'll see the old fireplace going right up to the ceiling. Yes, yes, you can see that it's blackened here and all the way up with the stone. I mean, there's plenty of space there. It's absolutely huge. And you can imagine this is where they'd sort of roast pigs and ox and all those heat. people sleeping out the front of it. Absolutely fantastic. Hugh and Sue are clearly passionate about their house and they've obviously adapted well to country living. But I wanted to know what it was that made them move away from their city lives in the first place and to find out if they thought they'd made the right decision. So Hugh, tell me how you came to live in such an amazing place. Well, it was more about sort of, well, what do we want to do with our lives? You know, from my point of view, I'd spent 25 years hard graft learning things, school, college, then 25 years really hard graft working for other people. And I just felt there had to be something more. So age 50, handed in the notice, and we moved lock, stock and barrel as a family to this wonderful location for the start of the most incredible adventure. Well, Sue, did it make a massive difference to your life? Well, it's obviously... Um we were living in a village beforehand with quite close neighbours. Here we're up a mountain, no neighbours, but the life is just uh, so different. Obviously we see more of Hugh now that he's home. And how about your children? You have two children. This must have meant quite an upheaval and change for them as well. How have they coped? I think they've done brilliantly. Uh, Sanya, our daughter, she's away at university. She came when she was just starting her GCSEs, had to cope with a Welsh school and she really enjoyed it. And Hayden, he's now 14. Um, it's um, every boy's dream. He fishes, he climbs mountains, he rides his bike. He can just explore. It's absolutely perfect. Given all the amazing countryside and views that you're used to, would you ever consider going back to a built-up area? Well, it, it would be difficult. I think we're very, very lucky to be living here. The, the views are so many and so varied. You, you can just go out your front door in any direction and there's a view for you. Yeah, well, I, I have to pinch myself sometimes to check I'm, I'm not dreaming. Where I think we are is the sort of place that some people spend hours getting to just to see a view, and we just open the door and mm. there it is. This really is an amazing house, steeped in history and situated in one of the most scenic parts of Britain. Clearly, this existence isn't for everybody, so it's great to see that Hugh and Sue have really embraced their new lifestyles. And if it wasn't for the hard work of Colonel Andrew Campbell, the family wouldn't be enjoying the dream existence they have today. This station may be his epitaph, but surely he should be remembered more for the fantastic restoration he's done to create the amazing medieval house that Hugh and Sue call their home today. If the blue skies and dramatic hills of this region appeal to you, here's our guide to the type of property you can get for your money here. Just down the road from Hugh and Sue's hillside retreat is this imposing detached grade two listed farmhouse. With accommodation over three floors, this property has an impressive seven bedrooms and is believed to date back to 1568. As with Hugh and Sue's house, it retains many of its original features, including inglenook fireplaces and a wealth of exposed beams. The house comes with two and a half acres of land, a paddock and a double stable. It's a lot of property for your money. We found it on the market for offers over £500,000. For those on a more modest budget, this quaint Snowdonian cottage is the type of house you might be interested in. 
It occupies a convenient village centre location, but still enjoys a magnificent open outlook. This two-bedroom house would be ideal for a young couple, or somebody looking for a tranquil area to retire to. This Grade 2 listed cottage demands an asking price of £185,000. But our star Snowdonia location has to be this stunning seven-bedroom mansion in Puthwelly. If you were won over by the grand Italianate architecture at Port Merion, where the prisoner was filmed, then this is the dream home for you. This Grade 2 listed property just down the road was created using the designs of the same architect, Clough Williams Ellis. The house dates back to around 1500, but was fully restored and refurbished in the 1970s. This home is particularly well suited for entertaining, with the main reception rooms being arranged around the impressive entrance hall. The outside of the house is equally as impressive, and a heated swimming pool and all-weather tennis court can be found in the 30-acre grounds. The price tag of £1.65 million may be beyond most people's means, but there's no doubt it's an impressive place to call home. That's it for this part of the show, but after the break, Melissa heads to Northumberland to seek out the locations used in the Robin of Sherwood series. Just look at it, it's incredible! And meets the couple who found their dream home in nearby Annick. We've got fabulous views out of the window and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to come here anyway. The British coastline offers many iconic views from the White Cliffs of Dover to St Michael's Mount in Cornwall. But one of the most recognisable sites is Banbra Castle on the Northumberland coast. And not surprisingly, it's a view that features prominently on many of our popular TV dramas and films. I went to check out the views of the Northumberland coast firsthand. The landscape of Northumberland is full of drama, from its wild open spaces to its windswept beaches and vast historic castles. This is one of Britain's most striking views. Just look at it, it's incredible. But walking along the coast at Bambra, what with the sea on my left and the castle up there, it feels like I'm in some sort of historic, timeless scene. Ooh, now there is a thought. He's arrived, my lord, and he's alone. Excellent. Whatever happens, it's the end of Robin Hood. Bambra Castle was the perfect setting for the ITV version of Robin Hood. It starred a dashing Michael Prade battling alongside Merryman Ray Winston. What's your name? Robin. If you want a period battle scene, Northumberland is definitely the place to come. Just 17 miles down the coast in Annick is another fantastically preserved castle. This was also used in the Robin of Sherwood story to bring to life his battles with the Sheriff of Nottingham's men. There's no escaping the star quality of this 700-year-old castle. It's been used in loads of TV and big screen dramas from Elizabeth to Blackadder and perhaps most famously, Harry Potter. This was the original Hogwarts. Now, it's not difficult to see why so many filmmakers have fallen in love with the castle. It's so authentic that it makes Annick and the surrounding places feel a little bit magical. You don't have to be hanging off a broomstick to see that Annick itself is an impressive medieval town. Even the main route into the place looks like something from a film set. But it's not just movie makers who can bring history back to life in this part of the world. At the end of this very long drive live a family who have always wanted to live in a country home. So they bought a rundown manor house and did it up. I can't wait to see it. Leamington Hall, just outside Annick, is a Georgian mansion with its own medieval tower. Squeezing into its 17 bedrooms are the Ruff family. Mum Helen was a police sergeant, while Dad Aidan ran an electronics firm before they moved into property development. They now care for daughter Bethany at the hall, while son Charles is at university and Alex at boarding school. Welcome, Welcome to Leamington Hall. Hall. It's always been the Ruff's ambition to live in a big country house, and for them, the reality is living up to the dream. 
I just love the, the space, I love the privacy, I love the freedom. For me, it felt like I was just coming home. It wasn't a new house, it was home. I love getting up early and I put my wellies on and I go straight out the front door and there's nobody at all and it's lovely and private and quiet, it's beautiful. The Ruffs bought the property four years ago for £1.3 million. Pounds. Oh, hello. hello! Hello! Oh, I'm Melissa, it's pleased nice to, meet to meet you. you finally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm hello. Helen. Pleased oh. to meet you too. Oh Hi. my gosh, well done. Oh Welcome my gosh. Here. This is incredible. Yeah, it's a lovely space. You like a little it's cottage, nice. do you? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it's nice and light. It's nice. A cosy cottage this is not. There's plenty of space to hang your coat up in this hall. Leading off it are a number of large and very grand reception rooms. But what makes this place truly amazing is that it has an ensuite castle with fantastic views from all over the house. This is very grand. Do I have to watch Abs where I sit? Absolutely not. There's no point having something that looks really smart that's not usable. And every single thing barring the light has cost minimal sums of money, less than £200. Barring the television, yeah. Those cities. Yeah. We were very fortunate with these. We picked them up for £120 each. So, you yeah. are kidding. Yeah. Fireplace. Fireplace was the fire in the house yeah, that's when actually, we came in. The fireplace is yeah. actually listed. Is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. But we like this room primarily because it faces due southwest. We've got fabulous views out of the window and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to come here anyway. It's absolutely brilliant. There's nothing there to suggest that the view there has probably changed over the last 400 years. So Ooh. this is the dining room. Lovely. How many of these have you got? Oh, We've just got the one. Just the <laughs> one. <laughs> this is as big as my flat. It actually could be double the size. What have you got a giant lion there for? <laughs> well, it's a nice, interesting piece of heritage that was rescued as an exhibit from a London museum. What about all the detailing on the walls? Were you lucky enough to find it all in its well, some original of it was, state? Well, some of it was still here, but a lot of it had been damaged. It was one of those great times mm. when you come and view a house for the first time. I was more or less salivating at, at the original yeah. door furniture and the right. carvings and things because so much has been put into the house in, initially. <laughs> The sheer size of the furniture and the strength of the colours in this room all add to its sense of drama. Where do we go, right or left? Left. Left. You need a map, an orientation map, right? <laughs> Leamington Hall was privately owned for centuries, but in the early 1900s it fell into disrepair. Following its renovation, it had several owners before the roofs took on the task of restoring it to its former glory. Aidan, Helen, so your motivation for buying this home was that you wanted views to die for? There was definitely a big part of it. The views from our previous house were, were fine, but nothing special. But here, the vistas that you see out of the windows are incredible. When we actually drove down the drive for our first viewing, it was... the decision was made at that point for Oh, me. yeah, we hadn't even stepped in the door. Yeah. It was... Yeah. we were, just fell in love with it immediately. What was the condition like when you first saw it? When we took it, it was... It wasn't derelict, but it was going that way. In another few years, it would have definitely gone that way. The gentleman who lived here carefully closed the house up with boarding on the windows and mm. things. So the first three months, it was a case of excitedly running around and gradually waking the house up, letting the light in and just letting the house breathe and come alive again. So that was a really good point. We knew what we were taking on, but having said that, our son at the time, who was about 12, did look at it with some dismay and said, Mummy, why do we always have to live in broken houses? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been really nice to actually um, buy something like this to put our stamp on it. So mm. now, in 100 years' time, they'll see what we did. And so we're now part of the nation's heritage to a certain extent. Hey, the style of this room is very different to what you've done in the rest of the house. I think the best thing when we viewed this house was we opened this door and this was a complete surprise. This was where the original house um, began about 700 years ago as a fortified peel tower. The Peel Tower was basically a mini castle built to keep invaders out and it stood here for several centuries before the Georgian part of the property was added onto it. This would have been where the local English or Northumbrian residents would have run to when the Scots came rolling over the border to steal their sheep or their cattle. So cattle, sheep, children, everything would have been piled into the, the lower floor of the Peel Tower and then they, they would have come up these stairs behind me up into this section and sat by the fire, warm and snug, and thrown things at the Scots out of the window, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and in contrast, nowadays, it's just so peaceful. Yeah, it's the one part of the house which we use probably as much as we use the main living room. 
We've got another couple of interesting items in this room. Come and look. Right, you've got a cheeky smirk on your <laughs> face, which is worrying me. It's well, all looking a, pretty safe. You have a <laughs> perfectly ordinary window bay. However, if you pop this off... Oops. <gasps> we have a priest's hole, which goes all the way down to the foundations of the tower. If the tower was invaded and you need somewhere to get out quickly, you climb into here and you end up down in the cellars. And local history has it that there's a, a tunnel which leads from here down to Edlington Castle. Yeah. So you could move from one tower to the other, effectively, or one castle to the other, without actually going outside. But even after leaving the Great Hall to climb the tower, there were more surprises in store. In the heart of the Peel Tower itself is a medieval bedroom, furnished in sumptuous colours with fantastic views across the formal gardens. Sadly, the same cannot be said of the other room leading off this ancient stone staircase, located directly beneath the Great Hall. According to local legend, it had a very grisly use. In the olden days, right up there would have been a wooden hatch. And when a Scottish person that they didn't want around anymore was taken prisoner, they would drop him through the hatch door into this room alive and he was left here for six months before he was cleaned out. Obviously dead. Thankfully, the rest of the house has a less gruesome history. Despite the incredible grandeur of the newer part of the house, the Ruffs have managed to make this place feel like a very warm family home. The kitchen is huge but cosy. The bathrooms, there are six in all, are large and luxurious, while each of the 17 bedrooms has its own unique character. The master bedroom, as well as having the biggest four-poster in the house, also has spectacular views across Northumberland. But there's somewhere that can top even this outlook. Oh, this is incredible. From the top of the tower, you get the most incredible views. Come and have a look here, through these battlements, just in the distance over there, you can just spot Scotland. Now, originally, this would have been designed to keep out invaders and to keep a watch out. But now I can enjoy the sunshine and look out onto the surrounding landscape. And I can easily see why the roughs fell so in love with the scenery all about them. Every single day, I feel very fortunate to have achieved what I set out to achieve. I cannot see a downside, apart from sometimes, obviously, in the winter, it's absolutely freezing and we have so many jumpers and we can hardly walk. But I still have immense satisfaction from having bought here and, and enjoying living in it. The roughs have been very savvy when it comes to transforming what was originally an old crumbly manor house and then transforming it into a very warm, cosy home. I'd say it's been a combination of factors, including a very sympathetic restoration programme and their warmth and energy as a family. They all had a dream and this is their fabulous reality. If you want to buy into the fantastic history and drama of this part of the world, we found a number of great properties from which to do so. Having your own mansion like the Ruffs may be a bit much, so how about just one wing of a castle? Kalali Castle is just 10 miles outside Annick and divided into apartments with great views and use of the grounds. This three-bedroom home has an open plan feel thanks to the gallery overlooking the beautifully refurbished drawing room. We found it on the market for £385,000. Much larger and more traditional is this Victorian villa in Annick itself. It has three generously proportioned reception rooms with many original features and a kitchen diner to die for. The upstairs bedrooms have huge sash windows making the most of the outlook. All for the princely sum of £650,000. But for great castles and dramatic landscapes, it really doesn't get much better than this. Northumberland's famous Holy Island is a truly magnificent location. You have to drive across a tidal causeway some 20 miles north of Annick to get to this property, but by golly, it's worth it. 
This Georgian-style cottage farmhouse is in a great location. Inside, it feels cosy but not cramped. There's a south-facing shaker-style kitchen dining room and three bedrooms upstairs. The price of this little piece of Northumbrian heaven? A shade under £480,000. Details of all the locations and properties featured in today's programme can be found on the ITV website at www.itv.com forward slash live the dream. Whether it's up in the mountains or by the sea, for some people you just can't beat the house with a view. And having seen the homes in today's show, it's easy to see why. Absolutely, so do join us next time when we'll be meeting more people who are able to live the dream as seen on screen. Fabulous. Well, Live the Dream as seen on screen will be back next Monday at the same time with more from the world of lavish lifestyles. Up next here on ITV3, the heat gets turned up in Taggart.